Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the third session of the Fortune Talk series. This is a series which has been envisaged as a platform to guide and uh, support the uh, civil services aspirants gearing up for their interviews. The topic for today's session is ge changing geopolitics of West Asia, regional and international responses. Now, West Asia as a region is one of the most important geopolitical hotspots in the world. The region is important for a, due to a variety of factors. Now, to name a few, I can just point out uh, the strategic geography of the region, the fact that it hosts some of the most important vital lines of communication, important lines of energy lines and supply lines to the world economy, the fact that it is a, it is a region which, which is endemic to sectarian conflicts, the presence of such a huge diaspora in the region, which becomes a major factor for India, in fact, to be interested in West Asia. So with such a multitude of factors, West Asia truly is one of the most important geopolitical hotspots in the world. Now, to discuss a topic of this depth and breadth, we have a distinguished speaker with us today, Dr. Stanley Johnny, the International Affairs Editor at The Hindu. Dr. John, uh, Stanley Johnny is an alumnus of the Jawaharlal Nehru University, Delhi. He completed his PhD from the School of International Studies at JNU. Now, I don't need to give a very detailed, even uh, there's even a need for me to give a detailed introduction of the speaker because Dr. Stanley Johnny already has a cult following among the UPC aspirants. Not a day passes when we don't see an article written by him in the Hindu. And uh, personally, I always, I'm always on the lookout for the articles which come weekly once, wherein he dwells in depth, but in the most precise and concise format of any particular regional issues boiling at the time. It could be a conflict in Yemen, it could be the US election or the Afghan peace process, but the way in which he actually structures and gives a detail in his articles is something which caters to the requirements of people, practitioners of diplomacy, of people who are interested in international affairs and even for the layman. And I think that is a testament of true and powerful writing. And uh, Dr. Stanley Johnny is also the author of the book, uh, ISIS Caliphate from Syria to the Doorsteps of India. Uh, this is a book which uh, details the meteoric rise of the ISIS as a non-state actor in, uh, in 2014. It deals with the geopolitical, the organizational, and the ideological roots of ISIS as an organization. And I would recommend anyone who is interested in this particular non-state act of ISIS to read this particular book. On a personal note, I'm actually curious and eagerly waiting for the release of his next book, which uh, recently I saw in social media when he has shared. Uh, Inshallah, the title itself is, has ignited my curiosity and the book again published by HarperCollins. So I am eagerly awaiting uh, the release of the book. So without further ado, welcome, sir. It's an honor to have you here. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping before we begin. We'll have a session of around 30, 35 to 40 minutes uh, session, after which we'll have a Q&A session. And any of the questions which the attendees, uh, any questions which you have, please put it in the chat window here. We'll try to accommodate as, as many questions as possible and uh, based on the time requirements. So welcome, sir. It's an honor to have you here again. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I hope I am audible. Yes, you are. Yeah, yeah. So uh, good morning, everyone. And thanks, Deepak, for the kind introduction. I'm uh, happy to be here. I'm glad to interact with uh, uh, the future diplomats and the bureaucrats. It's an honor for me as well. And also, yeah, the topic is also, it's, it's on West Asia. West Asia is something that it is, that is close to my heart. You know, I've been a student of West Asian politics for, uh, you know, for a long time, actually. I, my, my, uh, I, I, I did my master's in international uh, studies and then went on to do PhD and PhD was in West Asia. So I, I researched on Lebanon and Hezbollah. Uh, so yeah, uh, so I'm happy uh, I'm, uh, and thank you for having me here. Uh, and then coming to the topic, uh, you see, uh, yeah, the title is The Changing Geopolitics of West Asia. Uh, why changing, you know, what is, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a question that might cross our mind is uh, uh, why uh, changing geopolitics, you know? Yeah, it's, we know that geopolitics is not constant. Nothing is constant for that matter. 
geopolitics to be specific. Uh, but at the same time in West Asia, if you look at West Asian uh, political history, West Asian, in West Asia, uh, geopolitics is more fluid than in other parts of the world. You know, it, it's less constant because uh, you just look at the post-war history of the region, you know, uh, there are lots of, uh, there are major changes in uh, the alliance systems, in, in partnerships, in great power interventions, everything in the region. For example, see Egypt, uh, in the first half of the Cold War, Egypt was a pro-Soviet power. And you see in the late 1970s, Egypt just crosses uh, across the board and then it becomes pro-American. It joins, it becomes an American ally. And Iran, for example, till 1979 was an American ally. And Iran was one of the two pillars of America's Middle East policy till 1979. And one Islamic revolution and America has become the great Satan in Iran. And then uh, you look at Egypt and Jordan again. Uh, you know, Egypt fought the 1948 war, 19 and then uh, the 1957 Suez crisis, and again 1967 war, and then 1973 Yom Kippur war. So it fought four wars with Israel, but Egypt became the first Arab country to establish diplomatic relationship with Israel in 1978, 1979. And Jordan, Jordan also fought 1948 war, 1967 war, uh, and then Jordan became the second Arab country to recognize Israel in 1994. Uh, so uh, it's interesting if you look at the changes. Middle East has always seen massive uh, geopolitical changes. And then, you know, uh, what we would look at today is what are the changes underway in the region? And we would look at it with a special focus on the Biden administration. Because you see, uh, American presidents, most almost all American presidents uh, uh, post-war, after the Second World War, have left deep imprints on West Asia. Uh, uh, like, for example, in 1948, uh, FDR, Franklin Roosevelt, met uh, King Abdulaziz of Saudi Arabia, the founder of the kingdom, father of the reigning monarch. Uh, in 1948, on USS Quincy uh, in Egypt, uh, in which they, uh, you know, they made the, the first agreement, the, 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 they laid the foundations of the US-Saudi alliance, the partnership. So according to which the Americans promised security to the kingdom and uh, the Saudis promised oil in return to the Americans. Uh, yeah, uh, so, uh, uh, so, this is, uh, so that was the beginning of the cooperation, America's uh, you know, engagement in the region. And since then we have seen, um, you know, uh, yeah, let's see that uh, when the Suez crisis was on, Eisenhower was the president, Eisenhower threatened Israel with sanctions uh, unless it withdraws from the Sinai and Israel finally withdrew. The Soviets had also threatened Israel at that time, Khrushchev. And then uh, Jimmy Carter hosted the Camp David Agreement in 1978, uh, you know, which led to the uh, peace deal between uh, the, the Egyptians and the Israelis. And uh, Reagan sent troops to Lebanon in the midst of the Lebanese civil war, and he had to withdraw the troops later. And then George Bush, uh, the first George Bush administration, we saw that, uh, you know, the 1991 Gulf War, he, he attacked Iraq when Iraq went into Kuwait. And then uh, his son, when George W. Bush uh, was the president, he invaded Iraq, practically destroyed the country. Uh, and Iraq is yet to recover fully from the American invasion of 2003. Obama uh, bombed Libya. He ousted uh, Muammar Gaddafi, and Libya is also kind of after Gaddafi was ousted, Libya was divided into, you know, two governments, two parliaments, and a protracted civil war, uh, you know, and they are now, recently they got a unity government a couple of days ago, you may have seen that story. And, but Obama had also, uh, you know, uh, reached out to the Iranians and signed the Iran nuclear deal, which signaled, which signaled a massive shift in America's policy towards the region, at least since 1979. Uh, and then Trump, Trump had taken a completely different uh, approach towards the region, but then even under Trump's uh, mediation, uh, you, you had the Abraham Accords, because after the 1994 Jordan-Israel uh, agreement, it took, uh, you know, the, the, the next Arab, the third Arab country that established ties with Israel was the United Arab Emirates last year, last August, and it held under Trump's mediation. And under Trump's mediation, four Arab countries, UAE, Bahrain, Sudan, and uh, uh, Morocco, 
uh, reached out to uh, Israel and then signed peace agreements with Israel, which the Americans, the Trump administration called the Abraham Accords. So, see, this is the br brief overview of how American presidents, you know, left policy imprints in the region. Uh, so, but, and also Middle East, you know, uh, it is, it is a very, it is a critical uh, region for the United States. It's been for the United States since the end of the Second World War. We know that during the Cold War, the Cold War was actually fought in Eastern Europe, but uh, it was uh, West Asia that ensured that, or that, uh, you know, uh, America's security, America's energy requirements were largely met from the region. So West Asia always stayed a very important, a critical component of America's uh, foreign policy, even during the Cold War. And after the Cold War, we can see that the, that the region was, uh, you know, stepping up the ladder because uh, uh, it, it became the primary theater of the United States war on terror. Uh, yeah, Afghanistan is not geographically part of West Asia, but politically it's part of this war on terror, America's war on terror geography. Or then you look at uh, uh, Iraq or Syria or other countries. So West Asia would become the primary theater of the United States external foreign policy interventions since the end of the Cold War. And then the last three American presidents, including Joe Biden, uh, you know, Biden, uh, Trump, and Barack Obama, they faced a different set of challenges with regard to their engagement with West Asia. Why? Because there are two reasons. One, when the United States got bogged down in West Asia, China was rising in East Asia. And uh, it was Obama who came up with pivot to Asia foreign policy doctrine. So the main, the main idea of PO to Asia was that the United States has to refocus away from West Asia to uh, East Asia, where it has to deal with uh, China. And we saw this China-American uh, rivalry uh, sharpening under the Trump administration. And then Biden is, of course, the continuity from Trump to Biden is it's America's approach towards China because the first major summit Biden has called, multilateral summit Biden has called, is the Quad Summit, which is happening tomorrow. So that shows uh, the importance uh, Biden administration is uh, laying on uh, Indo-Pacific and uh, the challenges rising from China. And almost all American, most American documents, security documents released by the Pentagon, State Department, or even the guidelines issued by the White House, they all identify China as the main challenge to the United States in, in the current times. So this, this actually started from Obama administration had realized that uh, the United States has to refocus away from West Asia, where it was, where it got stuck with media conflicts to East Asia. So that is one strategic reality uh, these three American presidents faced. And on the other side, America's ability to shape political outcomes in the region especially in, in West Asia, was also in decline. Because you see, let's take uh, uh, the case of uh, Afghanistan. Afghanistan, after 20 years of war, the United States is now uh, struggling hard to get out of that uh, conflict. You know, and the Trump administration uh, signed a deal with uh, uh, Taliban in last February. And uh, uh, according to that agreement, the United States is scheduled to withdraw its troops from Afghanistan by May. And Anthony Blinken, the Secretary of, State, Secretary of State of Joe Biden, sent a letter to Afghan president recently in which he has, uh, he, he was, he had bluntly, he has put it that once the Americans are out, uh, it's possible he is worried that the Taliban would, uh, the Taliban would uh, uh, make territorial gains. So the United States is seeking uh, uh, ways to get out of uh, Afghanistan after 20 years of war. And in Iraq, you see that uh, the country is, as I said earlier, is yet to overcome from the wounds of uh, the war, which the, Ameri which the United States started in 2003. And in Libya is another example. So these military interventions, yeah, in Iraq, they ousted uh, Saddam Hussein. In Libya, they ousted Muammar Gaddafi. But what happens after you oust a regime? You know, the United States has struggled to stabilize these countries. Uh, and uh, so this is also, this is, so because of this, prolonged the conflicts. So there is a consensus or a, at least a growing opinion in Washington, D.C. that the United States should not go into more wars in the region. So Bob Gates, who was uh, uh, the defense secretary of both Barack Obama and uh, George W. Bush, 
once said any future defense secretary who is advising the president to send the land army to Asia, especially to the Middle East, should get his head checked. So it's it's he said this uh, uh, publicly, you know. So uh, this so there is a consensus among the strategic community in DC that the United States should stay away from unnecessary uh, war, which Obama called bad wars. Uh, so so that is that is one thing. So uh, so what they did, Obama had yeah, it's true that in the in his first term he went to Libya, but uh, what his uh, second term his policy suggests that Obama realized that it was a mistake. Going into Libya was a mistake because in his second term, even when Obama came under pressure, both from the Republicans and the Democrats, for not acting, you know, enough boldly in Vizavi Syria, so Obama still resisted those pressure and stayed away from going for a regime change war in Syria. Uh, so Obama had realized that, uh, uh, at least in his second term, that he should resist these temptations of the Bush era, the neocon uh, foreign policy approach towards the region. Uh, so, uh, so, but the approach is, so, so you have two problems, right? One is uh, you have to give more attention, more focus, more strategic attention to East Asia, where you have a much bigger challenge. Secondly, your own ability to shape political outcomes in the region in West Asia is in decline. But you have interest in the region. I won't say that the United States is retreating from the Middle East. I think that a retreat is too heavy a word. But the United States is refocusing or it is, uh, you know, reassessing its engagement, its region. It's what, what the United States wants to do is to continue to protect its interests in the region with less resources, without resorting to war, without getting stuck in more conflicts in the region. I think that is the strategic calculation of the United States vis-a-vis uh, West Asia. So Obama, Trump, and Biden. So these three are facing this strategic reality, and they are coming up with, I think, different approaches to this problem. So what Obama did was that Obama identified in his second term the key problem, the key challenge the United States is facing is Iran's nuclear program. So you have to address that problem. So why it is a key challenge? Why? Because um, one is, uh, I think Iran, Iran, Iranian leadership had repeatedly said that they were not chasing a bomb. Uh, they may be true, but I think uh, uh, Iran's nuclear program was more than a peaceful uh, nuclear power program. So maybe Iran would like to attain the capability to make bomb and stop short of making the actual bomb. So at least you will have, so that could establish some kind of deterrence. Uh, and then if Iran reaches that capacity, so that means Israel's nuclear monopoly uh, would end in the region. Uh, secondly, it, it could also trigger a chain, you know, a chain of uh, arms, race, arms race in the region. So the United States did not want Iran to attain that capability. So Obama, uh, what he decided that, okay, you, you have all kinds of options on the table. Well, one is to go to war with Iran, which would be disastrous. Obama wasn't ready to provoke Iran even in Syria. So why should he go to Iran? You know, and also you have these examples of Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, and everything uh, on your side. So the better option is to reach out to the Iranians diplomatically. And that's what Obama did in 2015. They finally, after, you know, after two years of painstaking diplomacy, they reached the Iran nuclear deal. And Hassan Rouhani was the president of Iran, who is a moderate. Uh, compared to Iranian standards. And then uh, that was also helpful. Iran under economic pressure, Iran was also uh, seeking uh, uh, ways to get out of this economic sanctions stranglehold. And then they reached the agreement. And according to the agreement, Iran decided to scuttle its nuclear program and open its nuclear sites to international inspection and in return for lifting of the sanctions. But Obama faced, you know, it, this was a major change in America's foreign policy since 1979, because since 1979, Iran was your primary rival in the region. And suddenly you are engaging with Iran. So that will have repercussions. The major repercussion was that America's two main allies in the region, the United States and Israel, both continued to see Iran as their major rival. So there is a, uh, you know, a subtle difference in the United States approach to Iran and Saudi Arabia Israel's approach to Iran. 
the united states did not see iran as a strategic threat of course iran is not a strategic threat to the united states the world's mightiest military power but iran's nuclear program is a threat because of the two reasons i mentioned earlier so it was a focused approach so you have to address the nuclear program so that's what obama's foreign policy was but for saudi arabia and israel they saw iran as a threat so okay, okay you are removing iran's nuclear program and then you are lifting the sanctions which means you are making iran economically more powerful more assertive in the region allowing iran to reach its natural economic potential iran is a country with a huge natural uh, you know gas and uh, uh, high hydrocarbon resources so that means you are removing the nuclear program but you are empowering iran economically saudi arabia and iran continue to see the saudi arabia and israel continue to see this as a threat so there is a divergent divergence in the united states approach and its allies approach towards iran but obama what obama did obama tried to uh, uh, you know win over his allies with a different set of policies he supported saudi arabia's war on yemen the saudi started the war in 2015 march when the nuclear deal was in the final stages of negotiations and he uh, offered unprecedented protection to israel in the un security council so there was during the obama administration 8 years of obama administration uh, obama's ambassador in the un voted against israel only once and that was uh, in the last days of the obama presidency so throughout his uh, uh, term Obama offered Obama actually practically offered unprecedented protection to Israel's activities in international forums. Uh, so this by this by doing this Obama tried to balance between his outreach to Iran which was a focused which was a clearly focused approach and his alliance his partnerships with his allies. And Obama also believed that he said in his interview to Atlantic that to find peace and stability and order in the region there has to be some kind of cold peace between the saudis and the iranians because he see them as two poles of the region and he believed that there has to be some kind of adjustment they have to learn to share uh, the region that's what obama said so this was his approach and then you have trump you know trump had a completely different ap approach but let's see that trump also faced the same problem which obama did uh, and the problem is that uh, uh, you know using force against iran or any other country in the united states would be extremely risky but trump was uh, more you know inclined uh, or you can say he was more aggressive than barack obama was because he assassinated qasem soleimani uh, uh, in in uh, 2020 january the uh, top iranian general but at the same time you see the difference what what trump did was that uh, trump entered the nuclear deal because the trump administration saw iran uh, the, they restored the old neo conservative approach towards iran that iran is the main rival uh, of the us and its allies in the region so he dumped the nuclear deal and then he reimposed the sanctions on iran and he also empowered america's allies like israel and saudi arabia uh, to protect their interests and then he he um, uh, he targeted uh, qasem soleimani as well but see he attacked trump attacked qasem soleimani inside iraq not in iraq not in iran trump was also wary of taking the war taking the conflict with iran inside iran so this attack happened in iraq and when iran retaliated by launching uh, missile strikes against american bases <clears throat> inside iraq trump decided not to uh, use force against iran again and when american when an american drone was shot down by the iranians over the gulf again president trump decided not to use force against the iranians so he was also too he was also too cautious not to launch a full scale war with iran because this this is this is a this is a growing consensus in washington but at the same time he had taken a more aggressive line because trump's calculation was that uh if you impose more sanctions on iran and then if you are uh, you know uh, uh, squeezing iran economically iran might come back to talks so that the united states could ha could have negotiations not only about iran's nuclear program 
but also about its regional activities. So that was the calculation. But you know, the problem is that uh, both America's allies and its friends know that the United States is wary of getting into another war in the region, at least for now. And the Iranians also know that. They know that this was the weakest sport. The United States could do this with economic sanctions, but another military conflict, a direct military conflict with Iran, it is, at least for now, it is not on the table. So the Iranians decided to play a risky game in return. So in response for America's maximum pressure, the Iranians, what the Iranians did, they came up with maximum resistance. They targeted Saudi oil facilities, right, in 2019. Two of Saudi Arabia's major oil facilities came under attack and knocked down half of uh, Aramco's oil production for a week. And then uh, the Houthis, the Houthi rebels in Yemen, they continued to attack Saudi uh, targets across the border. They, they continued to launch rocket attacks at Saudi Arabia. And the original understanding between the United States and Saudi Arabia reached between King Abdulaziz and FDR was that the United States would ensure Saudi Arabia security in return for oil. But when Saudi oil facilities came under attack in 2019, Trump did nothing. So that, is, that was also, you know, uh, the Saudis also uh, realized that in this lack of appetite for the United States to take risk in the region, that is endangering their security concerns as well at a time when Iran is acting more aggressively. Because from Iran's point of view, they, we, they, they once negotiated with the United States, they once reached an agreement with the United States, and it was the United States that dumped that agreement and reimposed the sanctions on us. So we are not going to budge again. We are going to resist. We are going to take that risk. And that was the Iranian approach. So, so you can say that Trump's policy towards Iran was, yeah, it was a it was disastrous policy. But at the same time, the rise of Iran and Trump's support for Saudi Arabia and uh, uh, Israel, it produced some results diplomatically because the, the prospect of the United States disengaging or reassessing, you know, uh, its, its presence in the region and also the rising common threat of Iran, it forced Israel and other Gulf countries, especially UAE, to come together. Saudi Arabia hasn't done it yet, but it's a, um, you know, it, it, it could be a matter of time. Once the king departs, if MBS becomes the king, it's possible that Saudi Arabia would also sign a normalization agreement with the Israelis. So this was Trump's, on, the, on, on one side, you can say that uh, Trump's Iran policy was dangerous and disastrous to a certain extent. But on the other side, uh, uh, it had uh, uh, prompted the countries, America's allies in the region, to come together on a more open platform because they've been doing this backroom contacts forever, but now they are more open. The Gulf kingdoms and Israel are more open to uh, cooperate in facing the common challenges they are facing in the region. So, and then let's see that when it comes to Biden. So Biden faces the same challenge, right? As we saw, uh, uh, Biden's primary foreign policy priority, I think, is China. There is no doubt about it. Uh, you look at his initial foreign policy decisions, uh, everything he has, uh, he has reached an understanding with Japan and South Korea to share the cost of hosting American uh, troops in the region. And he has called for the Quad uh, leaders, prime minister summit tomorrow. So the focus is definitely on China. And uh, the Biden administ administration has also uh, mentioned uh, has also made it clear that uh, there is there would be some amount of continuity from Trump's China policy to Biden's China policy because Biden is not going to end the trade war, the trade war which Trump started. But then the question arises is that Biden faces the same um, challenge which Obama faced or Trump faced in West Asia. The challenge is that how you are going to uh, you know address uh, your concerns or your interests or uh, assure your partners in West Asia, a region that has been associated with America's foreign policy all these years, when you are eventually refocusing away from the region to address a much bigger challenge in East Asia. So um, you look at some of the early decisions Biden administration has taken in the region. Uh, you know, uh, Biden uh, 
as soon as uh, he took office, Anthony Blinken has said that the United States is committed to return to the Iranian nuclear deal. The question now is who will blink first? Because Iran says it was the United States that pulled out of the nuclear deal, and it is up to the United States to return to the nuclear deal and lift the sanctions. Anthony Blinken has said that Iran, which is currently violating the terms of the agreement, should comply with the terms of the agreement so that the United States would reconsider uh, uh, the sanctions on Iran. So basically, both sides have, you know, uh, uh, they have expressed their commitment to reviving the nuclear deal. How they will do it uh, is the question that we have to wait and see. So one is the diplomatic outreach to Iran. And at the same time, the Biden administration has decided to end America's support for Saudi Arabia's war in Yemen. And it has lifted the Houthi uh, Shia militias in Yemen off the list of terrorist organizations, which Trump put them on in the last days of his presidency. And Biden has also, uh, the administration had also released an intelligence report on Saudi uh, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman uh, that the intelligence assessment is that it was MBS who ordered the assassination of Jamal Khashoggi uh, in the Istanbul Consulate of Saudi Arabia, uh, the Saudi dissident journalist and Washington Post columnist. So what does, uh, you know, uh, what do these uh, developments signify? So what we, and, and, and uh, the United States had also ordered a hit on, had also launched an airstrike in Syria on pro-Iran uh, militias pro-Iran rebels uh, a couple of weeks ago. So this shows basically Biden wants to, you know, um, reorient America's policy towards the region in which he is also seeking some kind of balance. And the balance is between Iran and like Obama, the same challenge Obama faced, Iran and Saudi Arabia. So on the one side, he is reaching out to Iran diplomatically to resolve the nuclear program because he also thinks that the nuclear program is a key challenge. And that has to be addressed. And to address the nuclear program, it's uh, uh, going to war with Iran is extremely risky. So the only possible option is to do it diplomatically with promises of lifting sanctions on Iran, the same uh, policy which Obama had adopted. But at the same time, Obama faced a criticism for not doing enough in taking on Iran's regional activities because Iran supports lots of Shia militia groups in the region. Iran has Hezbollah in Lebanon. Iran has uh, popular mobilization units in Iraq, the Dawa party in Iraq. And uh, it has lots of uh, militias within Syria that fought the war alongside the regime of Bashar al-Assad. And it also, Iran is also reportedly backing the Houthis in Yemen. So what the Biden administration did, while at the same time it made the diplomatic outreach to Iran, it also launched an airstrike against pro-Iran militants in Syria. So the airstrike was a response, basically a retaliation for an attack launched by pro-Iran militants in Iraq on an American base in Erbil, in Iraqi Kurdistan. So basically he is sending a mixed, he's sending both you know, feelers and warning to Iran. And on the other side, by ending America's war, America's support for the Saudi war on Yemen and releasing the intelligence report on MBS, Biden wants to reign in Saudi Arabia. So the message is that the Trump era open support for Saudi Arabia is over. So, and it is also a message to the Iranians while Biden wants to deal with, engage with the, with the Iranians that see the, the Trump era policy of offering unprecedented support to Saudi Arabia, your key regional rival is over. I am ready to take them to task, at least to make them more responsible so you deal with me diplomatically. But I am not going to give you a free ride either. If your proxies, if your militants, pro-Iran militants, are going to target American bases or American diplomats in Iraq or in Syria, we will attack you as well. So this is the mixed message Biden is trying to send. So this is the old school diplomacy like that. Biden wants a more ordered, he wants to reshape the region. He wants a more ordered region in which Iran's nuclear program is addressed diplomatically. So which means the path to a nuclear weapon would be cut off. Uh, that can be done diplomatically. And at the same time, Iran's regional activities would be reined in. 
and saudi arabia could be a more uh, saudi arabia could be a more uh, balanced more ordered power more responsible power in the region so he is trying to strike a balance between these two so in a calmer more ordered region the united states could actually you know in a region where there are no major conflicts the united states could actually shift its focus away from west asia to uh, facing china where you know in the indo pacific the game is only beginning this is the uh, 1940s basically we are the advent of the cold war so we are facing a new basically a beginning of a new cold war in the indo pacific now uh, so the united states has to refocus away from west asia so this is biden's calculus but you see this has uh, potential risks as well uh, the main geopolitical change we we face in the region is that one is that the united states has to lighten its presence in the region because it's facing major challenges elsewhere so this is uh, you know a great power is reorienting its engagement with the region that would have lasting impacts in the region secondly uh, saudi arabia which has been which has long been an american ally since 1945 saudi arabia is having doubts about america its partnership with the united states because the united states is forced to engage with iran so what would what that would leave the saudis in thirdly if there if the nuclear deal is revived if the sanctions are removed iran could again become or it would start a new path for iran uh, to attain its economic potential that would leave iran economically more powerful and where would that leave the region in so these are the main changes uh, that the region is facing and the challenges biden faces in reorienting his or the united states uh, policy towards the region is that you see one is the attack on the the uh, iran pro iran militants in syria that could be seen in tehran as a show of uh, you know uh, a weakness of strength rather than a tough warning from the biden administration why because uh, we saw that uh, when donald trump launched an attack on qasem soleimani he carried out the attack in iraq not in iran he didn't want to Uh, take the war inside iran and when biden ordered a hit a retaliation for an attack by pro iran militants inside iraq he carried out the attack in syria further away from from iraq biden didn't even want to take the battle to iraq because he would think that that would alienate further the iraqi even the iraqi leadership iraqi politicians are already critical of the united states and american presence in the region in the country so he took it to iran uh, syria which is you know kind of uh, uh, everybody is there in syria the russians are there the americans are there the israelis are carrying out repeated air strikes so so rather than a warning the iranians could look at as uh, you know as a weakness uh, in in the biden administration's attack and secondly when qasem soleimani was killed the trump administration said that uh, president trump had reestablished america's deterrence in the region by taking out a key iranian general but what happened after that uh, there was a barrage of attacks missile attacks rocket attacks by uh, pro iran rebels against the americans in the region against the us bases against uh, the us embassy which is in the green zone in baghdad uh, so what deterrence we are talking about and so even now after biden started biden launched the attack on uh, the rebels on the militants in syria even even after that american presence in in iraq continued to face rocket attacks from pro iran uh, rebels so this is a slippery slope biden may be thinking that by launching a one time attack or twice he could win in the iranians but i think that could be an ambitious uh, way of looking at it and then thirdly saudi arabia uh, so uh, if you look at closely we can see some ruptures in the saudi american uh, partnership like uh, yeah the united states did not come to defend the saudis in 2019 when their royal facilities came under attack and the saudis have established very good ties with the russians uh, recently 
And in West Asia now, it's the United States is not the only big power that is present in the region. You know, the Russians are there in uh, Syria. And also Turkey is also keen on playing a bigger role in the region. Turkey has placed uh, troops in Qatar. Um, and and uh, Turkey is uh, uh, Turkey plays an active role in Libya, and Turkey has also established very deep ties with the Muslim Brotherhood networks in the region. And and Turkey under Erdogan wants to play a much bigger role in West Asia than the previous uh, Turkish administrations did, because their focus was on Europe, whereas Erdogan's focus is on West Asia and North Africa. Uh, so uh, uh, the Saudis uh, think that the United States, yeah, United States is realigning its uh, uh, policy towards the region. It is keen on engaging the Iranians. So the Saudis may have to think on their own. And also uh, with this intelligence report, uh, clearly they have the Americans have alienated MBS. So Biden has apparently sent out the message to Riyadh that. Uh, 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 he would like to deal with the king directly, not the crown prince. But the king uh, is uh, very sick. He is, uh, he is ailing. And MBS is the de facto ruler. So un unless Biden has a plan B to ascend MBS's, uh, to, to stop MBS's ascent to the throne, it is a matter of time before MBS becomes the king. Uh, so uh, either Biden or future American administration will have to deal with MBS in the future. And then MBS will have more options uh, than dealing with only the United States uh, when the time comes. And thirdly, the elephant in the room is Israel. You know, how are you going to deal with Israel? Because uh, Biden, uh, you know, uh, when Biden, if Biden reaches out to Iranians and signs the uh, nuclear deal or revives the nuclear deal with Iran, Israel would certainly be upset. And Israel, when Obama did that, Israel tried to torpedo the deal in many ways. Uh, and then uh, uh, recently when Trump was the president, Israel had carried out uh, many operations, uh, intelligence as well as military operations inside Iran, including the assassination of Mohsen Fakhri Sadeh, the top uh, nuclear scientist uh, of Iran. Uh, so Israel would not like uh, the Iran nuclear deal being revived. So that is a key challenge which Biden is going to face. Secondly, what Biden is going to do about the occupation of the Palestinian territories, because Biden says human rights and democracy are going to be the cornerstones of his foreign policy. So if he is talking foreign policy, he is talking human rights to the Saudis, how he is going to accommodate Israel, which is an occupying force, which is being investigated by the International Criminal Court for war crimes in the, in the occupied territories into his larger scheme of things. So if he is overlooking the Israeli occupation, if he does nothing, uh, uh, you know, uh, when Israel is expanding its settlements in the region, uh, he would be accused of double standards. And if he is putting pressure on Israel at, a, at, at the same time when he is reaching out to the Iranians, Israel's uh, main regional rival, that would infuriate the Israelis further. So these are the dilemmas he is facing. So uh, we will have to wait and see how the Biden approach to West Asia is going to play out, whether he would succeed in his attempt to uh, reshape the politics, geopolitics of the region, or whether he would leave a more messier region behind while the United States is gradually refocusing away from the region. So I'll end it here. And I know we have to discuss more, including India's options, uh, India's foreign policy options, considering the changes that are underway in the region. So we will take that up uh, in the discussion, in the question and answer session. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. That was uh, amazing. I mean, based on the notes and points which I've written, uh, we have covered a lot of uh, ground, right, from the world history. You have started from the American policy, as an example, from Eisenhower, Jimmy Carter to Obama, to Trump, and now with Biden. Uh, so I one of the things which I found very interesting is uh, this kind of, uh, what, what would I say, the focus or the priority of the United States to shift from West Asia, a shift in the sense maybe partially shift from West Asia towards East Asia, where as you said, uh, the game is on. I mean, we, we are talking about a resurgent uh, China and again, the entire focus on Indo-Pacific with India itself asserting so much, uh, 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 so much participation in the Indian Ocean region. So when this shift is occurring, will that lead to a 
vacuum in west asia i mean i'm not talking about an entire shift but will it have regional repercussions in west asia because this is a time when we are going to have i think next week we are going to have elections in israel we are going to have the uh, the us pulling out of troops in afghanistan soon in may and again uh, regarding the recent developments if we have elections in iran in june we are i mean we are going to um, probably not see the a moderate like rohani again so all of these things are going to create a lot of changes in the west asia as well and this would in fact directly have bearing on india as well so how would you think an american shift from west asia how would that in the long term affect india as well yeah <clears throat> uh yeah i think uh, see uh, if we look at it this way indian foreign policy for uh, for india i think now the three there are three main pillars in the region you look at the security dynamics of west asia one is israel america's most important ally second is saudi arabia which was a very important american partner at least so far third is iran which is a rival of these two blocks so the, there are these are three main pillars from an indian point of view for us all these three pillars are important because with israel india yeah india established full diplomatic relationship in 1992 uh, india still uh, remains committed to the palestinian uh, formation of the palestinian state but still with israel india has developed a very close bilateral and defense partnership and uh, and that by and and the defense partnership has defense uh, partnership has uh, taken off uh, really well in recent uh, years especially uh, under the modi government and then uh, secondly saudi arabia is also an important uh, uh, player saudi arabia india and saudi arabia one one is of course oil the oil is there and then millions of indians are working in the gulf and then thirdly uh, saudi arabia indo, indo saudi relationship has uh, you know uh, attained a different dimension in recently uh, in the fight against the global terrorism etc etc uh, so both and saudi arabia has also seen if you look at saudi policies recently that saudi arabia has also seen that it's keen to engage more the old uh, indo pakistan rivalry or the kashmir issue saudi arabia is also keen to go beyond this issues and establish a more robust relationship with india uh, so is uae uh, so that is uh, second thing and thirdly iran iran if you look at iran as uh, you know oil is a factor but oil you can say that you can if the iranian oil is not available for us of course iranian oil if it if it is if the sanctions are removed it's all the better but if the iranian oil is not available for us you can always buy oil from saudi arabia or you can buy it from iraq that's what the indians did Uh, when there were sanctions on iran so that's possible but geography is not something which you can't pick you know it is not you can't buy it from the market so iran for you is a critical country because it is the gateway to to central asia so that's why india is despite the pressure american pressure etc etc india stayed committed to the chabahar port why because chabahar would open the gates to central asia and from chabahar by road you have access to afghanistan so which means you will have access to afghanistan bypassing pakistan uh, so uh, to afghanistan to central asia uh, iran uh, is a key component in india's uh, foreign policy calculus so but the problem is that when when uh, this iran us rivalry is being played out in the region uh uh we india is always the collateral uh, damage because partly because india you know um, uh, succumbs to american pressure at times because india voted against iran in 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 iaea when manmohan singh was the prime minister but at that time india at least said that we would uh, go by only international sanctions only if there are un sanctions we would abide by it uh, sushma swaraj when she was the foreign minister she had also said the same but when trump administration reimposed sanctions on iran india had uh, cut down its uh, oil imports from uh, iran so the problem is that when there is a shift in american policy towards iran india suffers but i think india's natural priority is that india's natural foreign policy priority is that india needs deep ties with all these three pillars in the region now 
so uh, this american policy was a uh, policy was a major america's shifting policy was a major challenge india faced in uh, you know scripting its own policy options on the region now that biden is the president and biden has clearly stated that he wants to revive the nuclear deal so which means the obama era realism is kind of back in washington dc but biden is facing challenges in reviving the nuclear deal that's a different matter but at least the at least the approach in dc has changed so the question india could ask is that if joe biden um, can reach out to the americans uh, reach out to the iranians why can't we have a full diplomatic relationship why can't we have uh, other you know energy ties and uh, uh, investments we we could have made investments in chabahar etc etc so this opens all kind of possibilities for india and then secondly uh when the united states actually does this of course it will have if the united states disengages from the region partial disengagement from the region not complete retreat when the united states does it certainly it will have rep regional repercussions it would leave a vacuum that's true but the vacuum i think uh, there are other countries in the region that are already ready to fill that vacuum uh, uh say uh, as i said uh, turkey is more keen Turkey is uh, building its own alliance with uh, Qatar and uh, Libya and other, other kind of countries, and Iran has its own alliance there. Iran has Iran, Syria, and Hezbollah, and even Iraq to a certain extent. Uh, and Israel, on the other side, will have a stronger, uh, will try to build a stronger relationship with with uh, Sunni countries that are American allies. So uh, you will have a. Uh, a different kind of you know three pillars emerging in the region so israel and saudi arabia uh, may not be on two sides so israel and saudi arabia the cooperation would be stronger and then turkey would emerge as a new pillar in the region and in iran if the sanctions are removed would become a uh, uh, stronger and economically more stronger uh, power in the region but there are geopolitical pitfalls still there are geopolitical pitfalls the uh, pitfalls are like uh, you know iran has a very strong regional presence through its proxies not through governments if it's through governments you could say it's bilateral relationship but if it's through proxies you are enabling non state actors you could always be accused of uh, promoting terrorism so that's what uh, the americans and the saudis are now doing so they say that iran is supporting the houthis iran is supporting the hezbollah hezbollah is not a legitimate actor in a sense it's not the government Uh, it's a, it's a proto state within lebanon so the so this means uh, as as long as the conflicts remain in the region uh, these contradictions remain in the region it could lead to conflicts between these three pillars as well so these are the changes we largely see so india has to treat cautiously here why because uh, in a sense it's good for india because the pressure is once the pressure is uh, lifted from iran it uh, would make it easier for india to engage with iran because india's traditional policy is to retain your strategic autonomy and then you deal with all kind of powers you deal with the chinese the russians the americans the same way you can deal with the iranians the saudi israelis and the turks so it's possible but at the same time you have to be mindful of the geopolitical pitfalls that would continue to uh, rule politics in the region thank you sir i think uh, that was a comprehensive take and uh, you have also answered uh, along with it you have also answered one of the questions posed by a netin participant about the three poles in west asia uh, politics uh, another question i would say see regarding the troop pull out from afghanistan and yeah. uh, the fact that since you have already covered it like this uh, the antony blinken's letter then the response by the ghani government and uh, between the us and why there's a lot of things going on and again although the us is insisting on a pull out even the the commander of the forces is saying that how the afghan army could handle it yeah. can they actually stop the eventual rise of the taliban and this yeah. is going to again have a direct implication on india so is it time that we should although that would be putting it too much but still should we make a shift from our traditional policy towards afghanistan or is there any chance for uh, the boots on the ground policy from you know getting a little bit of deviation at least so what is your take on that yeah i think boots on the ground would be disastrous exactly they shouldn't even consider that the americans are trying to get their boots out of the 
ground no uh, exactly. they are they are trying hard to do that and, and the, the whole uh, diplomatic initiative with americans are doing uh, is to end the war and uh, in my view the biggest problem uh, with america's uh, disengagement disengagement from the taliban was uh, from afghanistan was its decision to direct uh, taliban uh, decision to deal with the taliban directly without including the afghan government you know that was the biggest folly the trump administration did because uh, the americans held direct talks with taliban taliban did not want the government to be involved in the talks because the taliban uh, do not recognize the afghan government the americans said yes to it and after the deal uh, basically you have to put pressure on pakistan to to extract concessions from the taliban because pakistan is the country that is hosting the taliban and instead of doing that the trump administration put pressure on the ghani government to extract concessions from them so that taliban prisoners would be released and 5000 prisoners would be released so uh, anyway it is a policy that's gone wrong the us disengagement from from afghanistan but you should also look at the other way because the united states is desperate because the united states has concluded long ago that it's a lost war they can't turn around the war they lost the war so what they could do is to get out of afghanistan and they fear that once they get out of afghanistan taliban would take over you know like it happened in the past like once the soviets were out the soviets were out in 1989 from afghanistan in 1991 soviet union collapsed in 1992 the government of najibullah fell and in 96 najibullah was uh, hung upside hung from a, a public lamp post in kabul and the taliban captured kabul in 96 so it's a matter of time and even if you look at uh, uh, the history of uh, uh, afghanistan you look at vietnam uh, because the united states the same thing united states uh, uh, dealt with the vietnam guerrillas directly without including uh, the south vietnamese government and the americans struck a deal with them and got out of uh, 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 vietnam and within a year uh, the rebels the communists took over south vietnam completely so here uh, there were two one is the anthony blinken letter in which blinken says yeah he is blunt uh, in the letter he says uh, his concern is that once the americans are out taliban would make rapid territorial gains that's what he said i read i was reading the letter the other day and secondly when uh, uh, austin miller was asked by dexter filkins of the new yorker so he asked uh, do you think uh, afghan troops would be able to defend they are country against the taliban he doesn't say that they would he says they have to they have to <laughs> yeah they have to so it's interesting which means the americans think that once they are out taliban would take over the country that's their strategic assessment so that's why to avoid that what the americans are doing at least using the existing leverage whatever they have they have 2500 troops in in afghanistan some 10000 uh, nato troops are also there and afghanistan has uh, yeah uh, 250000 elite uh, specially trained troops as well so it would not be easy for taliban also it would be a prolonged battle but still so what the americans are trying to do using the existing leverage they are trying to get the taliban uh, to accept some concessions you know uh, some uh, some kind of an agreement so that there would be an interim government in which both ghani and the taliban would share power but ghani says i am the elected president why should i share power with the taliban so it's a mess it's a complete mess so india i think uh, yeah india has invested a lot in uh, afghanistan over the last 20 years and uh, uh, india has been invited for this uh, multilateral un us proposed un led multilateral talks as well by if india accepts that i haven't seen any official response from new delhi so far uh, because this letter has been it's a leaked letter right it is the americans haven't released this letter so new delhi hasn't responded to it but if india accepts the uh, proposal i think india would accept it that itself shows india's policy towards afghanistan is changing because till now india said that india supports an afghan led afghan on peace process for afghanistan so now you are joining in a peace process right you are not uh, you are a different country you are joining with uh, the united states iran uh, pakistan afghanistan and russia and china so which means the afghan owned afghan led peace process is gone so this is the new challenge i think india has recognized that uh, it's time to change its old policy uh, but 
definitely i don't think that indian policy makers would send troops to the ground they would be involved in multilateral talks to find uh, some uh, mechanism so that india could support the government because of this group if you look at this group india is the only ally of the afghan government because the pakistanis are not the americans are now dealing with both the taliban and the afghan government the chinese and the russians also have established a good ties with both the taliban and the afghan government so are the iranians so here the only country that deals only with the government that has a very good ties with the afghan government is india in this group yeah we have two more questions uh, do you have time to take them uh, yeah we'll do it two more questions okay. then we'll wrap up so one question is uh, related i think that's a very relevant question to ask you that is can we expect a resurgence of isis in west asia as uh, due to this retreat by us yeah um see uh, isis has been its physical infrastructure has been destroyed uh because isis at its uh, zenith has been controlling territories as big as great britain uh starting from the outskirts of uh, uh, damascus to the outskirts of baghdad uh, in which millions of people lived now isis doesn't control any major cities it is uh, confined to some deserted or mountainous regions in iraq and syria so its physical infrastructure has been destroyed definitely uh, uh, but at the same time we can't rule out uh, a complete you know uh, rule out uh, resurgence in uh, in the uh, medium term it is not because of the us disengagement it is because of the uh, the geopolitical pitfalls in the region why because you see uh, al qaeda in iraq that is isis predecessor al qaeda in iraq uh, was very active and dangerous uh, in 2005 2005 and 2006 and in 2006 uh, abu musa al zarqawi was killed by an american attack and after that in iraq the united states came up with a, a strategy of recruiting sunni uh, militias to fight this uh, jihadis uh which they called the awakening the us recruited the us us funded them so they 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 made this local militia groups sunnis who fought al qaeda in iraq so sarkawi was killed and then the, there was this sunni awakening groups so as part of this basically aqi was pushed to the corner so it became uh, you know a small group of a few hundred uh, militants under the command of uh, this little known figure abu bakr al baghdadi but then two things happened one is the government of iraq nuri al maliki's government turned extremely shia sectarian which uh, you know um, kind of alienated the sunni populace in southern iraq which isis or aq aqi uh, they uh, capitalized on this growing resentment among the sunnis secondly the crisis in syria because once the crisis broke out in syria all kind of factors were there the geopolitical angle of the syrian crisis was that syrian president who is an ally of iran and hezbollah bashar al assad so once the crisis was there the turks were there the saudis were there the qataris were there the jordanians were there the americans were there the, the europeans were there everybody wanted assad to go because once assad goes a vital link between hezbollah and iran would be taken out so iran assad and hezbollah all will be weakened this was the geopolitical calculation and it turned syrian conflict into a geopolitical civil war you know so and isis found it uh, uh, very convenient because when a whole country plunges into anarchy jihadist groups would find it easier to thrive uh, so then this was the beginning of the rise of the isis for the rapid rise the sectarianism in uh, uh, iraq and the civil war in syria So the the point is the sectarian problem still exists in the region the shia sunni sectarian issue the, that is the crux of uh, saudi uh, iran rivalry as well so the the situation the uh, you know uh, in the region is that if you don't address if you if if you turn sectarian again in in iraq if the civil war syrians if biden decides to uh, you know uh, bomb syria again or weaken the syrian government so all these decisions you would be taking in the future could could help i am not saying it will help but it depends on the actual circumstances of of west asia 
and the actual circumstances haven't changed radically. So that ISIS could make a comeback if the situation turns worse again. Thank you, sir. So the final question, and uh, I think this is much of a broader question on Indian foreign policy. So West Asia is considered as India's extended neighborhood. What would be the take on India by policies of the Biden administration and the rising presence of China in West Asia? So I think yeah. that's a very comprehensive uh, take on. Yeah, that's true. Uh, so uh, with regard to Biden administration, as I said earlier, one positive side of Biden's West Asia policy is that if Biden himself is trying to strike a balance between Iran, Saudi Arabia, and Israel, it would be easier for India also to strike a balance between these three countries. Ideally, India has to dissociate its foreign policy preferences from American preferences. Right? India shouldn't allow America to, to dictate terms to Indian foreign policy. But it's not happening. Uh, that's what we saw in the case of Iran. When the United States imposed sanctions on Iran, India has to cut oil imports from Iran. This is not an ideal situation, but that's what happened. So if you take the practical situation into consideration, uh, uh, what we could say is that Biden's overall balancing approach would help India's engagement with the region because India would seek to deepen engagement because Gulf is a vital part for India, not only for oil, but also for the presence of millions of uh, Indians, especially Malayalis uh, in the Gulf. And also uh, UAE and Saudi Arabia have played uh, an increasingly important role in the fight against terrorism. It is they are respecting India's sensitivities when it comes to issues like this. Uh, so uh, it, is, it is important for India. Uh, and Iran, on the other side, as we discussed, for oil, of course, and uh, connectivity. Israel for Israel, the problem is that, which, which is uh, what I am critical of India's policy is that, uh, especially under this government, there is an ideological tilt uh, in, Indian, in this government's foreign policy towards Israel, which I don't think is not desirable for us. Because for us, it has to be an ideology-less and partnership interest-based foreign policy, which India has to develop, not only with Israel, but also with the Gulf uh, axis, as well as Iran. So this ideology thing that is, you know, um, the, the ruling party has some kind of tilt towards Israel's Zionism, uh, which you can't blend that with India's foreign policy. That would be, that would, uh, you know, be counterproductive. So you, you remove that and then, established proper policy-based, interest-based, mutual interest-based approaches with these three blocks in the region. Because Turkey is not vital for India's interest, at least for now. But Iran, Israel, and Syria are not like that. Uh, and Saudi Arabia are not like that. So uh, Biden's foreign policy uh, in that sense is, uh, uh, is an opportunity for India to deepen its engagement uh, uh, with the region. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. The congruence in the hardliners in Israel and the, you know, the ideology with the, our own current government, yeah. uh, which is actually not uh, something desirable for the entire region, for our yeah. foreign policy, I must say. So I think we can uh, wind up with that. Uh, there, there were other questions as well, but most of the questions were connected to Afghanistan, Turkey, uh, uh, India's policy on Afghanistan, but all of these things are already covered in your talk. So that's why I think you have uh, combined and answered most of the questions, uh, address most of the questions. Thank you so much, sir. This has been absolutely amazing. I mean, we just had a complete over, uh, overview of the West Asia. This, as we said, I mean, West Asia is your specialization, specialist area, and uh, we could sense that the entire process and for years to come, India will have to witness, I mean, India will have to shape its policies based on the developments. And although we talked about a balance, so I think the balance which you mentioned regarding the US administration, it's going to be a delicate balance, which Indian policymakers will also have to watch keenly because uh, on one hand, you have to look at the Indo-Pacific and the rise of China, whereas on the other hand, you have to balance it out with the developments happening in uh, West Asia. So we'll see how this turns out. So thank you so much, sir. We are very happy to have had you here. I'm sure the students have benefited. We hope to see you again soon. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you, Deepak. And thanks. Th thank you all for attending the class. Thank you.